having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what, are the immeasurable, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Now, one of the vows that Corey's parents made just a minute ago was to pray with her and to pray for her. What should they pray? I just told you that we should be praying for those in our congregation who are working with children in our local schools. What should we pray? Well, this is helpful, what we just read, because here we have the Apostle Paul saying that he is remembering his fellow Christians in his prayers. That's what he says. In verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks to you, to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Then here you go. What's he say? We get three things Paul says he's praying for the Ephesians to know. This is what I want you to know. This is what I'm praying that you would know. Whether you're Corey Kugel or whether you're one of the educators who just stood up here a minute ago, I want you to know three things listed exactly from verses 18 and 19 of Ephesians 1. You should know the hope to which God has called you. You should know the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints. And you should know the immeasurable greatness of God's power. I want you to know the hope. I want you to know the riches, and I want you to know the power. First, let's know the hope. We have to be careful not to throw this word hope around too, too casually because we live in a world that is often a great struggle. Jonathan Sarks, the guy I got to know a little bit uh, about a year ago, started reading some of what he's written, some of what he's done in the area of sports journalism. You've probably never heard of him. He's a fairly known sports writer primarily focused on basketball, the NBA, the college basketball. He did a podcast. He wrote for a news outlet called The Ringer. Jonathan Sarks died last week. He was 35. He had a two-year-old son. Well, last April, he was diagnosed with an extremely rare form of sarcoma, a cancer which forms small tumors in the bones and connective tissues. Five-year survival rate under 30%. And he wrote at the time, he said, being diagnosed with terminal cancer doesn't happen like it does in the movies. Doctors don't actually tell you how long you have to live because they can't predict the future. What they say is, what you have will kill you at some point. We just don't know when. It could be months, it could be years, it could be longer. He says the only hope they can offer is that someone might find a cure before it's too late. That's the best they can do. That's the only hope they got. Not much certainty at all. Can't throw that word hope around too casually. Biblical hope, though, is different. What the Apostle Paul is praying for is different. In the Bible, the word hope is used to talk about something that is certain, that is guaranteed. When you're talking about biblical hope, you don't have to wonder. It's not like a doctor trying to guess as to how long someone might have. Because biblical hope, if you had it, and Jonathan Sarks, by the way, did have it, Biblical hope is certainly is a certainty that is grounded on what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. It is grounded on everything that Paul has been talking about up to this point when we get to, 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 to this text in, in, in chapter 1. It's grounded on everything he's been talking about. Who has, what has the ability to make your hope more than just wishful thinking, more than just confident expectation? What has the ability to make it certain? Well, that's what the beginning of chapter 1 was all about. Your hope can be a confident certainty when you know that you have been blessed by the Father, when you have been redeemed by the Son, and that you are accompanied by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul talks about at the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 1. Every Christian is known by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and accompanied by the Holy Spirit. Your hope can be certainty when you know that God has sent Jesus through His blood, Paul says in verse 7, Dying in our place to pay the penalty for the rebellion that we have committed against Him. That's when our hope can be certain. That's the foundation of our hope. 
It's like the hymn says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness, Jesus' blood and His righteousness. Now, if you're Corey Kugel, if you're one of the children that you're teaching in school, it's tough to think about eternity. It's tough to talk about death, and it's certainly the desire that we would have for every child to, to live a long life. But as Jonathan Sarks learned, no doctor, no parent, no teacher, no pastor, as much as he or she might want to, can give a guarantee as to how long you will live. But we can have, and the Bible does give us, a basis for a true and certain hope that we can proclaim with absolute certainty and that can never be taken away, that makes all the difference for the future based on what we can know here in the present about what God has done in the past. That's the first thing I'm praying for Corey. First thing I'm praying for the teachers, that as you approach your life, approach your sacred task, that you would know that true hope. The second thing for which I'm praying is that you would know the riches. Now, I want to clarify something, and when we actually studied this text in more detail a couple years ago, we talked about this, but I want you to look at verse 18. It says, Paul wants, Paul wants the Ephesians to know, he says, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Now, it is absolutely theologically true, and this is even talked about in other spots in Ephesians 1 and 2, but it is absolutely true that Christians have a blessing, have a glorious inheritance. We are heirs to that. We are heirs to God's blessing. We are adopted sons and therefore heirs. Paul talks about that. And there are many scholars that I trust and, uh, who believe that that's precisely what's in view here when Paul says that he wants the Ephesians to know the, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Many people who believe that that's what Paul's talking about, talking about the inheritance that Christians have. But others argue, and I think more convincingly, that given the context and the, and, and the understanding of the Greek phrase that's translated, his inheritance in the saints, understand that it's actually best to understand this as Paul saying that the Ephesians are the inheritance, right? The, 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 the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, the saints are, the, 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 the inheritance that is seen in the saints. Not that they get an inheritance from, from God, though that is also theologically true. But what Paul is saying here is that they themselves are God's inheritance. They are His glorious inheritance. They belong to Him. Now, if you want to know more about the technical discussion, contact me during the week and I can point you to some of the more technical arguments. But assuming for now that is what it's talking about, what does that mean? What difference does that make? Well, what it means is that God has a love for us that makes us His own. Every child wants to be loved. Steve and Jenny know that, and they love Corey. Every Christian educator who works with children knows that. And so they, not just, they don't just teach, but they love their students. And the love of a parent and the love of a teacher is essential, but our prayer is that every child and every person that we meet, our prayer, my prayer for, for you, is that you would come to know that you were even more loved than any teacher, than any parent, than any friend could possibly love you, that you are loved and that you are treasured by God. And of course, Paul is not, <coughs> Paul is not into pop self-esteem psychology here, right? The saints, as he calls them in verse 18, the followers of Jesus, are the inheritance, are the possession, are the treasure of God, not because they themselves have merited it or earned it, but because they are united with Jesus Christ. That's the key phrase that occurs throughout Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, the whole first part of the book. The key phrase is in Him. We are in Him. We are in Christ. Our union with Christ is what makes us God's treasured inheritance. And one of the primary things to which baptism points is that union with Christ. It is a seal that points us to the belonging that the Christian has in Jesus Christ. And I have an imprint seal that I use uh, on books. It kind of impresses uh, my name in, in the books that are in my office. It shows that they're mine. I mark them as my possession. Now, what difference does it make if you were to know that you are marked as a glory inher glorious inheritance to God? And, and, and keep this in mind. There is virtually no danger in damaging a child by telling them that they are a glorious inheritance, that they're a treasure and you're not going to damage them unless you base that statement upon something 
that doesn't have anything to back it up, unless you can't really back it up. Right? So if you base that statement to someone on, and, and you say you're a treasure and you base it somehow on their own inherent worth, well, they're quickly going to find as they live their life and as they fail to measure up to even their own standards that that's going to fail. If you base it even on the perfection of your own love for them, if you base it on that, then ultimately it's going to fail. If you can't back it up, then making that promise to a child is, is cruel. Jonathan Sarks, with his terminal cancer diagnosis, wrote about how through the process it brought him back to his own childhood, remembering his own father's funeral. His father had a degenerative disease all through Jonathan's teenage years, slowly slipped away before his eyes and died when Jonathan was 21. And he said at the funeral, he remembers that there was a bunch of people, people that I hadn't seen in years, and they all told me how sorry they were, and they asked whether there was anything they could do, and all I could think was, I don't know any of you. I know of you, I've heard your names, but I don't know you. In other words, he said that their offer of assistance, their offer of ongoing care for him, though sincerely intended, wasn't based on anything real that he could actually trust. Because the promise of care without the bond of a real relationship is just an empty promise, and then it becomes cruel. But that's not how it works with God. Not with Jesus. When your status as a glorious inheritance is based on a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then it is legally binding. You have real security. That's the promise that God makes that the Apostle Paul is communicating to those who are in Christ. He's saying your name is written on his beneficiary statement. Your, you have imprinted on you the name of Jesus Christ. And in that way, when you think about it that way, actually, the two possible interpretations of that that Greek phrase, they both come together here. The scholars debate it, but the two possibilities are bound together in one truth, and this is the truth. You are due an inheritance as an heir, because in Christ you are first an heir yourself. Being a Christian means that in the good and in the bad you're claimed, you're an inheritance, you're an adopted child of the king of the universe, the precious son, the precious daughter of a father who one day whenever that might be, will walk you with certainty into eternity. Now, last thing, Paul prays that you would know the hope that you have. That's number one. That's what we're praying for each other. It's what we're praying for Corey. It's what we're praying for our teachers. Know the hope that you have. He tells us that he wants us to to know the riches, the treasure that we are. Finally, he says he wants us to know the power that guarantees it all got to know the power. Here's where we need to do a little review of Ephesians. If you go back and you read Acts chapter 19, when Paul went to Ephesus to plant this church in the first place, you'll see that a very big issue, a very big debate in that city, as it was throughout a lot of the Greco-Roman world, was this, this, uh, this contest, how big is your God? There are all these different gods. They're in the Greek pantheon, the Roman pantheon. How big is your God? My God, is he more powerful than your God? That was the debate. Of course, in Ephesus, as is true everywhere, the one true God of the Bible defeats any competitor. It's no contest. Because God's power, this text tells us, is immeasurably great. It's not just great, it's immeasurably great. It's so great you can't even measure it. It's exceedingly great, which means that it is a power that is completely sufficient to help us with our struggles. It's, it's like that, um, here's another classic uh, hymn of the faith. This was from, um, from Veggie Tales. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla or the monsters on TV. God is bigger than the boogeyman, and he's watching out for you and me. Classic hymn. It's only a matter of time before that's in the Trinity hymnal. Right? But that last line, he's, the, the fact that he's not just bigger than the boogeyman, but that he's watching out for you and me. Do you get the distinction about why the second is as important as the first? Right? That makes a big difference for you. It makes a big difference for, for Corey, let me tell you. It makes a big difference for, for teachers. Because God could have lots of power and not be using that power to be looking out for us. He could be bigger than the boogeyman, but if he's not on our side, then at the end of the day, we have every right to still be fearful. But if he is, if he's not just bigger than the boogeyman and bigger than the monsters on TV, but he's also using that power to watch out for you and me, now then we can have confidence. Paul says he wants us to know that. 
the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us. That's what he says. In other words, God has made us the beneficiary of his power for our benefit. But do you know how he did that? This is interesting because this is a bit ironic. Do you know how God used in the greatest demonstration of his power in all of history? You know how he used, what he used to demonstrate that power? He used weakness. He used what it seems at first glance to be one of the most profound moments of weakness in all of history. When Jesus died on the cross, people thought it looked like weakness. But it was actually the most profound expression of God's power in all of history that the world has ever seen. Paul wrote to a different church, to the church in Corinth, that the message that he brings about this Jesus and this powerful God, it is apparent in weakness. We preach Christ crucified, he told them. And he said that people are going to stumble over that. They're going to look at that and it's going to confuse them about how in his death Jesus can be powerful because it seems, Paul said, it seems like it would be foolishness. But to those who are called, this apparent foolishness is the most profound wisdom. And this apparent weakness is stronger than any man. Because in the cross, God is displaying a love so deep because it is a love that costs him so much. It's a love that makes us the treasure and the glorious inheritance of God. This is is the song we sang earlier. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. That's what we are. We are his treasure, his inheritance, because the apparent weakness of the world is the most profound act of God's power in all of human history. That love, that becomes the power of life. That power of life is what defeats the power of death. That is what Jonathan Sarks had to come face to face with in his cancer diagnosis. A power that comes through weakness on the cross. Now, one very important thing. This power, Paul says, verse 18, is toward us who believe. That's important. It means that this power needs not just to be known, but it needs to be trusted. Each of us, and this will be true for little Corey, each of us has to consider these things for ourselves. There are some of you here who have been baptized. Some of you in this in this church, some in other churches, you've been baptized, but you haven't yet publicly declared your own personal faith in Jesus. You're part of our family. We love you, but because we love you, we need to remind you that it's not enough to believe in your baptism. You need to believe in Jesus. You need to believe in what he's done, not just because your mom and dad believe that, but because you do. And the hardest thing about that, probably the hardest thing about doing that, is you need to set aside when you do that your claim to power in your own life. In other words, all of us think that we have the power to control our own lives. And those who believe, believe because they've come to realize that that perceived power that we have needs to be set aside and we need to trust God's power instead. Believing means that you set aside your need to be powerful, your need for other people to think that you're powerful, and believe instead in the power of God. Now, this is how actually this whole Christian life works, not just when you first put your faith in him. It's not just when you believe in Jesus for the first time. Power through weakness is the way that God works in Christians throughout our entire lives. And that's, the, that's part of the point of returning to this text before we jump into the last two chapters of Ephesians next week, because returning to these foundational truths is absolutely critical so that we have a fixed point. We have a grounding, a foundation for living the Christian life, because that's what you get to in chapters 5 and 6. It gets very practical. We're going to start doing that next week. What does it mean? To, what does it look like in the Christian life to live as a follower of Jesus? But if you just start there without first submitting yourself to God's power that He has shown to us in His weakness, saving us and giving us an eternal hope, if you don't ground it in that instead, you're going to think that it just comes out of your own strength and your own power, which is actually not the gospel at all. So that's why we need to start here. Jonathan Sarks, in the middle of his cancer treatment earlier this year, this is what he wrote. He said, I want to believe in a miracle. There have been people with stage 4 sarcomas whose tumors have never come back. No one knows why. I asked my doctor if I could be one of those people. He replied, I'm not the one who decides those things. Jonathan wrote, well, I believe in a God who does decide those things, but I also know that he has chosen 
not to heal me, at least not yet. That's what he wrote. And we now know that as of last week, God chose not to heal Jonathan in this life. Jonathan wrote at the time, that knowledge, that even possibility, he said, that hurts. That's where the questions come, where you need to figure out, am I really trusting in God's power or my own? Is my life broken or did God mess up somehow? When those questions come, that's when it's so incredibly helpful to see that Paul finishes his sentence, not with verse 19, but he finishes it with verses 20 to 23. Because he says that the great power, God's great might, verse 19, is grounded upon the work of Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, look, I understand that you have a need for evidence here when I tell you, when I want for you to trust and hope in God's immeasurably great power. But you want evidence? Here's the evidence. Here's where you should look. You should look at Jesus Christ. You should look at him. And this is what he talked about. This is what we read in verses 20 and 23. Jesus, the one who was raised from the dead, that's your evidence. Jesus, the one who is seated victoriously today in heaven, that's your evidence. Jesus, who reigns and rules over all things, including cancer, that's your evidence. And then he gives them one last thing about Jesus in verse 22. And this ties us back actually to what we were talking about last week in Romans 12, talking about the church, right? He says Christ is reigning, Christ is risen, but in addition to that, or actually because of that, it means that Christ is the head over all things. You see this in verse 22, 23? Head over all things, given to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, when it says that Christ is the head of the church, there is a sense in which that carries the idea of authority. We talked about that last week. Jesus is in charge of his church. He directs his church. He rules his church. That's true, but there's something more. Because a head is not just in charge of the body. The head is inseparably connected to the body. In other words, the head-body metaphor that's used several times in the New Testament to talk about Jesus and his church, it shows us that Jesus is not only in charge of his church, but that he is vitally connected to his church. He inhabits his church. He inhabits the work of his church. He fills the church, it says. Which is a final reminder to us that while Jesus does relate to each of us individually, and we do have an individual relationship with Him as believers, but it reminds us that we also, and He relates to us also corporately. He intends for us to be together in His church. Let me go back to the Jonathan Sark story one more time because this is what impacted me the most. In an article that he wrote earlier this year, published on The Ringer, he makes one of the best cases for being a part of a church, one of the best cases I've, I've ever read. And he wrote this for a secular, secular news and sports website. But hey, I guess when you're, when you're about to die, they cut you a little bit of slack. Write whatever you want. He said in this article that the small group church relationships he forged in the years before his diagnosis, that's what carried him through this last year. He said, human beings aren't supposed to go through life as faces in a crowd. In other words, we're supposed to know each other. And that happens only in a church where you make the effort in advance to forge those kinds of real relationships with other people that are based on something real and eternal, that are based on your relationship with Jesus. But Jonathan Sark said something else about the benefit of of close church community that I found absolutely fascinating, particularly on a Sunday when we baptized Corey. Jonathan said the hardest thing, understandably, any parent would feel this, understandably the hardest thing about facing death was what it would mean for his two-year-old son. His own father, remember, got sick when he was only 12, and he said he never really, even though he was 12, those teenage years are so formative, he said, I never really felt like I got to know him, not as another man. He said, I had to figure it out all on my own. And now it looks like my son might have to do the same. It was the one thing that I never wanted for him. Which is why close community in the church, Jonathan says, came for him, came to be for him his most important, listen to what he called it, his most important insurance policy. He wrote, people talk a lot about medical insurance and life insurance when you get terminally sick. They're always asking you about your medical insurance and your life insurance. He said, but relational insurance is far more important. He remembered from his own childhood, and he said, I didn't really need my dad's money when he died, but I could have used some of his friends. 
So what Jonathan has done is, t- what Jonathan did was he told his closest friends at church, he said, when I see you in heaven, there's only one thing I'm going to ask you. Where were you when I died, and were you good to my son and my wife? Were you good to them? Does my son know you? Do you know my son? Does my son know you? He said all those years that he invested in this church community, that's what he called his relational insurance for which his child, his son, is the primary beneficiary. If you're a member of Calvary Presbyterian Church, I asked you to stand when I baptized Corey for a reason. I asked you if you would undertake the responsibility of assisting Stephen and Jenny in the Christian nurture of Corey for a reason. Because they desperately need you to mean it. I'm a father whose tomorrow, let's face it, is not guaranteed. I need to know that there are godly men who love my children if I no longer can. Every mother needs to know the same thing from every woman here. You may not have children of your own, but you made a vow to be there for this child this morning. Do you know Corey? Do you know her brothers, Titus and Ethan? Do you know Samuel and Quentin, Gus and Andrew? Astrid and Eli? Eric and Stacia and Luke? Lucy and Sammy and Jack? Zion and Abby and Essie and John, Judah and Nate and Maddie, Canaan, Austin, Davis, Amy, Mia, Eden, Danny, Esther. Do you know them? Do they know you? Your parents need you to. And if you're a member of this, you're a member of this church, you vowed to do it. But you don't do it without resources. You don't do it out of your own strength. The hope of the gospel that Paul lays out at the beginning of Ephesians is that the power and the strength and the energy to love other people comes not from ourselves, but it comes from a God who knows us. A Father who loved us by sending His Son to die for us so that we could know Him. You know that Son? Do you know that Son? Do you know His love? Because only from knowing that son will you have the love to be able to love mine. That's our hope in life and death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promises that you make to us. Promises that we simply pray back to you and ask for you to make effectual in our lives. Promises that we can't possibly keep in our own strength, but that you have kept for us through Jesus Christ. Lord, allow us to be the hope to one another, not out of our own power, but out of yours, constantly proclaiming and declaring the gospel that changes, saves, empowers, and delivers us home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.